Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's webinar. It's uh, March 30th, 2020, and we are now seeing the, the peaking of the coronavirus in terms of infections and fatalities. Um, there has been a relief package uh, signed uh, that you're all aware of, and MPAC is going to be doing an analysis breakdown on that package and how, is it, how it affects each and every one of us, as well as uh, uh, putting together a legislative tracker and all the other bills in the Congress at this time, and uh, looking at uh, other issues such as uh, the Department of Justice requesting expansion of authority and powers at this time and how it impacts civil liberties uh, of all Americans. So keep an eye out on that uh, for that. Uh, with us today is uh, Mansoor Khader of the Democratic National Committee. Thank you, Mansoor, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good, good to see you. It looks like you're in good health. Everything. Uh, how is your family? Alhamdulillah, they're doing. They're doing well. We're safe and healthy. Uh, I'm hoping others on the call, on the webinar, uh, are the same. Great. Um, so tell us. Uh, you know, there are a couple of issues related to the elections. The primaries have been postponed. How does that impact this race between Sanders and and Biden at this time? Yeah, so um, obviously, I think, um, like every other sort of major uh, institution um, in, in the country, uh, you know, we were, were this is a sort of unexpected crisis. And so uh, part of the adjustments um, that uh, the National Party and the DNC in particular have been making is um, our priority is uh, safety and the well-being of Democratic voters. Um, and also at the same time, the safety uh, of our democracy. Um, and obviously uh, in the past three years and actually uh, for a period of time, uh, there's been, uh, our democracy in particular has been assailed by uh, all sorts of attack. And so um, our um, a prerogative now uh, as we move into the final months of the primary calendar and then obviously looking into the general um, has been ensuring that states that have remaining primaries um, uh, that uh, we are encouraging them to uh, move to a vote by mail program um, and to use um, opportunities, uh, either early vote, uh, vote by mail, permanent absentee ballot, uh, to ensure that uh, those voters, those uh, voters in those states, have an opportunity to participate in a primary uh, election. Um, our our intent here um, at the party at uh, the DNC is to. Uh, make sure that the presidential primary uh, nominating process um, is transparent, um, it's fair and it's inclusive. Um, I think one of the lessons that we learned um, previously uh, and under uh, Chairman Tom Fred's leadership has been to uh, provide uh, the party uh, the proper process uh, so that our nominee as a sort of a, somebody that's credible, uh, I can work to defeat Donald Trump in the general election. Um, so yeah, um, you know, a lot of people are thinking, why why should we even be talking about the elections right now? The coronavirus uh, sure. is at the forefront, but you know, it all it, it is all about policy. It's it's uh, it's about how the the government is serving the average American family. So how do you how do you argue with uh, with people, uh, or how do you make that argument that this this is a critical time for us as a country, and we should be paying more attention to the elections. Um, our senior president, uh, Donald Trump, for the past several months, um, has been calling the coronavirus, has been calling this pandemic a hoax. Um, he refuted uh, scientific uh, data um, that has indicated that this was um, uh, a crisis um, that needed to have immediate full authority of the federal government to address. Um, Donald Trump is the reason why uh, it's imperative uh, uh, that Americans, uh, uh, that Muslims, uh, that disenfranchised communities, that uh, communities of color uh, uh, in particular, um, are leaned in with the election process, that uh, they take this opportunity uh, to ensure that their civil liberties, um, their uh, 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 the electoral uh, opportunities that exist, that they, that they take advantage of those. Um, currently, um, and, and this is a, a byproduct of, uh, of, of Democratic Party leadership in, on state level, where you have governors 
uh, in key states across the country, Democratic governors as well as Republican governors, uh, who have who have done um, an effective job of mitigating uh, the local community-based issues. But it's imperative that there's a federal presence. There's a, uh, it, it's imperative to have a federal coordinated effort to ensure that areas outside of those hotspots, those hotspot states, um, that those uh, individuals, those citizens are given safety and protection as well. And unfortunately, Trump and the Republicans have uh, completely failed at this, both on a, on a, on a, on a basic health le level and also, and, and also a leadership level managing the federal agencies. But the polls would say otherwise. He, he's, he's gotten uh, a, a, bu a bump up in the polls uh, as it relates to his handling of the coronavirus. So how do, you, how do you translate that? How do you break that down for people? Sure. Um, well, one is um, the, the level of trust the American people have in Donald Trump is very poor. Uh, a majority of the country does not see the president as a credible source of information on the coronavirus. I'll say that again. A majority of Americans do not see our sitting president as a credible source on information related to one of the largest pandemics of our generation. That is a failure of leadership. That's a failure of Donald Trump. It's a failure of the Republican Party. Uh, it's imperative uh, that uh, we mobilize as citizenry to ensure that there is uh, leadership, not only on a local level, like some of these governors have uh, been able to take leadership on, but also uh, um, an opportunity to elect folks on a federal, uh, for, for Congress, for Senate, uh, for the presidency, that allows us to have leadership at a time of need. And right now it's a time of need and our, our current uh, president has failed. Um, how do you unite the party? You know, it's, it, again, from the outside, it looks like it's splintered. You have the, the progressive uh, faction led by Bernie Sanders and um, you have the, the moderate uh, uh, or, or establishment faction, if you will, led by Biden. And Biden is the front runner, assuming he does get the nomination, which looks likely, but you never know what happens between now and, and July. We don't even, and we'll talk about the Democratic National Convention uh, after this. But how, how does Biden unite the party at a time when, when emotions are so high and people feel left out, especially those who have backed uh, Senator Sanders all this time? Uh, the Democratic Party is a, a very large coalition. I don't think there's any uh, doubt about that. Um, and the coalition is one that is very reflective of the Amer of America. Uh, in our current presidential primary uh, system, um, allows for the nomination uh, of a, of the next hopefully the next president of the United States through a transparent, inclusive process. Uh, uh, under Chairman Tom Perez's leadership at the DNC, uh, we went through a number of reforms. Uh, superdelegates, um, the idea of a superdelegate, the idea of an automatic delegate, um, that the superdelegates will not be playing a role uh, on electing, nominating um, uh, the president, or the presidential nominee for the party uh, at the convention, at least not on the first ballot. That was a reform that we put together, the DNC put together, Tom Perez put together, to make sure um, that the, the, no one was uh, putting their thumb on the scale um, and that the process itself was reflective of the will of the people uh, participating in the primary. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important in this particular election to participate is because this is one of the most transparent, most inclusive um, uh, democratic primary that, that we've launched. Um, and we have a confidence um, that by the end of the primary voting, um, where uh, we will have uh, uh, unprecedented turnout, uh, that there will be a consensus um, uh, and confidence and credibility around whomever that person is that takes the helm of the party in the general election. The other pieces I just want to mention real quick is um, there has been um, the presidential, the presidential, uh, through the presidential debates as well as the, the primary thus far, all the candidates, all the candidates 
um, have had uh, a commitment to support the Democratic nominee, whoever that person becomes. And we're going to be relying on those former candidates and the previous um, um, individuals to ensure that they bring their coalitions and their partnerships um, into the effort uh, uh, against Donald Trump. What about the disinformation campaign that we saw last year happen where people sure. uh, masquerading as uh, uh, Democrats, even as, as part of the Hillary Clinton campaign in, in 2016, not last year, um, telling people you can stay home and just text your vote? And what, 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 what should we be aware of? What can we do? What, what, what is the DNC doing about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, disinformation is a huge problem. Disinformation is uh, not only problematic within sort of the, the, uh, the electoral and the uh, process of, of our party, um, but, but also just the, um, it is a huge threat to uh, assortment of, uh, of institutions within civil society. And so I think misinformation as a um, uh, issue overall needs to, needs, needs uh, a sort of dedicated um, uh, campaign against. Uh, and yes, misinformation is going to be very consequential to this election. And so uh, it's imperative um, that individuals, right, um, primary days are uh, primary dates are changing. Um, if you are, if you want to ensure your um, civic uh, right, you should be aware of when those dates, when those dates have changed. Um, what are the new mechanisms to vote? Whether there's vote by mail, whether there's early vote, uh, whether it's only in person. People need to be informed of, of the sort of more salient information um, that connects them and binds them from what uh, privileges they have in this election to what they actually need to do. And so the, the, the two, the one to four suggestion that I have is, is make sure when you're getting information, when you're getting data, when you're getting a date, uh, when you're asking for a form, uh, uh, or understanding who you're uh, supporting or where you're volunteering, you're getting it from a credible source. Uh, unfortunately, social media, Facebook, Google, um, uh, big tech has been very unreliant in combating some of the, the key issues around misinformation. And so I would rather than use those uh, uh, communication channels, uh, I, instead of using those, I would uh, prefer uh, folks use credible um, election commission websites, election board websites, secretary of state's office to gain information um, from uh, about their election. And the second uh, source, resource would be going to the state Democratic Party. So if you live in Idaho, going to visit the Idaho Democratic Party or getting in touch with the I Idaho Democratic Party uh, person and, and asking those questions over the phone or checking websites online to make sure you know where you're going. Um, do you think that the media, mainly the, uh, the cable networks, uh, MSNBC, CNN, have provided uh, fair uh, coverage between the two candidates? That's a question I, I'm getting from one of our audience members. When you say when you say uh, when you say uh, the two candidates are say, uh, on the on the primary side, is that on the primary? I'm sorry. Yeah, I meant between Sanders and Biden, right? Um, okay. Um, well, I think the, um, the 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 role of the DNC, the role of the Democratic Party, and the role of a national um, organization like ourselves is, uh, for us, is to administer the primary, uh, is to administer a fair and transparent process and let the voters decide. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we went through um, such um, uh, hard work um, in 2017 and 2018 to make changes to the party uh, bylaws so that super delegates wouldn't be playing, wouldn't have the level of impact that they did uh, previously. And so our positioning um, is not to be sort of critique um, uh, the media in particular, but rather ensure that um, Democrats have an opportunity to participate in a system um, that's much more accessible, much more inclusive, uh, much more transparent than it previously has. And what we've seen is um, some historic turnouts uh, at the primaries thus far. We've seen um, uh, states who previously were caucuses Right, we had 14 states that were caucuses previously, um, and because of a reform and because of our uh, uh, leadership of Tom Perez, we, there's been from 14 states. There's only been there's only now seven caucuses, um, and hopefully, and maybe there's other uh, additional reforms that come about post 2020. 
Uh, but the position of the party is to ensure uh, a, a credible primary process rather than sort of playing, uh, sort of critiquing um, some of the uh, uh, views of the, of the media itself. Uh, do you see the Democratic National Committee either actually happening? Is it going to be postponed? Will people attend? Is it going to be? Yeah, sure. um, well, the Democratic National Convention is a very uh, critical component um, to the nominating process. Sorry, yeah, it, it, and, and I forgot to mention, this is scheduled for July 13th through the 16th, right? That's correct. In, in oh, Milwaukee. Uh, uh, and, and obviously, we're, uh, we, we're, very ex we're excited about the National Convention. Um, uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee um, is uh, would have been a, a uh, and could be a very, as a fantastic location. Wisconsin um, has gone through uh, a remarkable change um, in, in, in the past few years. Uh, uh, we've had some fantastic Democratic victories in the state and a recently elected Democrat uh, governor there. Uh, we are currently monitoring um, the progress of the pandemic. Um, and uh, trying to get a better assessment of where uh, Wisconsin is, uh, where the country is uh, later this later in April, um, later this spring, uh, where we are in the summer, um, and uh, exploring ways uh, to ensure that there is an opportunity to, for folks to participate for those delegates that are nominated. Um, at these state conventions um, through the our primary process for them to make sure that they have an opportunity uh, to participate in the nomination uh, of our, uh, our presidential uh, slate. Um, and so right now uh, we're sort of working through some scenarios. We're trying to get a better sense of where the country can be and, and trying to see what the impact could be for uh, our candidate in the general election. Um, tell us about the Senate. Uh there, there's a possibility that the Senate will flip towards the Democrats. What are the key states uh, and the key issues? I, you know, right now it's COVID-19 obviously is the, is the key issue, but what, you know, how, how has the Democratic Party looked at, you know, these states in terms of uh, winning over some of the voters in, in those states, in those battlegrounds? Yeah, um, I would actually take a step uh, back even, even further, right? I mean, I think the Senate is definitely in reach. Um, I think uh, Trump is very, uh, very vulnerable, and inshallah, we uh, defeat uh, Donald Trump uh, um, uh, this year. Uh, but even, even, um, even on a very local level, uh, I would say redistricting um, is a big priority uh, for uh, Democrats. Um, we want to make sure that uh, there is an opportunity for us to for to like Democrats in state house um, state house uh, seats, uh, state senate seats, um, and to make sure that the Democrats are elected to key statewide races. So we have uh, attorney generals who um, are much more aggressive in uh, ensuring and protecting civil liberties um, uh, for Americans and putting up um, a much more adversarial approach. Uh, when the federal government tries to encroach on any of those of those rights, uh, and then making sure that there's an executive, um, uh, a democratic executive, sitting on top of these state governments, uh, uh, it's so demonstrative of how effective good leadership can be uh, in places like New York and in California and the other uh, governors, Democrat governors, who really stepped up and showed what you know uh, leadership, political leadership, uh, looks like. Uh, and for us, you know, at the, at the party here, yeah, we're looking at Maine, right? Uh, where Susan Collins uh, in particular, who um, everyone sort of considers as sort of independent and uh, uh, someone that is a foil to Trump. Uh, that is all nonsense. Uh, 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 Susan Collins uh, uh, has a close to a 90 plus, 99 plus uh, voting record on Trump's um, on Trump issues. Uh, she sided with Trump on several key um, pieces of legislation, including um, uh, uh, his recent Supreme Court, um, the Kavanaugh Supreme Court vote. So, um, and, and her, her numbers in particular in Maine um, are uh, not very strong. Um, and she has to answer the questions of why she took these uh, votes uh, against the will of, of Mainers. Uh, and so, um, you know, that, that's a, a particular close example. And we, we're working very closely with the Maine Democratic Party. We're, we're closely 
uh, working closely with uh, the Democratic Senatorial Committee there, working very closely with activists on the ground there and monitoring the issue. There's a competitive primary. There's competitive Democratic primaries across the country. Um, I think there's opportunities for us to make a very strong challenge um, in making sure some, in, in Montana uh, that we pick up uh, that seat, that we have an opportunity to uh, make the race in Atlanta, in uh, Georgia, uh, very competitive. Uh, so for, for us, it's uh, focusing on the entire ballot. Uh, it's making sure that we're um, uh, uh, making sure that every race, every, every Republican on the ballot um, has a challenger and that they're forced to a answer questions of why they voted and why they failed in their leadership uh, uh, in, in, their, in their office itself. And so uh, for us, it's a, it's a holistic uh, approach. Uh, and we believe that 2020 is, is a real opportunity for us to uh, sort of flip, flip the, 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 uh, a lot of seats. You know, we put together a voter guide uh, every election, uh, every presidential election. We did it also for the primary. So if there's any information you need to give uh, us that we can put together in terms of those uh, key states, we'd be happy to do so. And I have to say, for the sake of our uh, nonpartisan status, I'd have to make an invitation to the Republican uh, National Committee as well. But sure. definitely, if you can, uh, we'd be happy to provide that in terms of the analyses uh, of, of these important candidates. And you're absolutely, yeah, absolutely right. Javier Becerra in California, as our Attorney General, has done tremendous work in ensuring our rights, uh, ensuring our health care uh, amidst this, uh, this crisis and even before. So um, he and, and, and Keith Ellison, uh, I think, uh, from Minnesota, uh, a former That's congressman, right. yeah. uh, Keith Ellison is now the state attorney general from Minnesota, has done, have done tremendous work in uh, securing the rights of people um, in, in this precarious time. Um, uh, one question from Tamim Chaudhry. Uh, with social distancing not giving away for some time, um, is the DNC seeking to support organizations that can offer digital opportunities for GOTV education, et cetera? And then related to that, a question from somebody else is about door knocking. I mean, that's how you get personal with the people. And one of the criticisms of the Democratic Party uh, in 2016 and the nominee at that time was there wasn't enough personal interaction. You, you kind of left it uh, to technology to take care of. So what can local groups do to help with GOTV and, and education and how do, we, how do we have door knocking campaigns at this time uh, when we're supposed to practice social distancing? Yeah, those are, those are really good questions. I, I mean, I think, um, you know, um, sort of the, the, the key identity of the Democratic Party is uh, we're an organizing mechanism. Um, it's something that uh, President uh, Barack Obama, sort of his, his um, uh, particular story of how he got involved politics was being a community organizer and making those personal touches. And so, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, it, it really uh, uh, challenges, uh, puts barriers around the core um, a mechanism for us to, to be able to build those uh, relationships with voters and to, to persuade uh, individuals who uh, perhaps don't see uh, the value of uh, what the party can, can deliver uh, on their behalf. Um, but the ways that we're um, ensuring um, that uh, we are uh, still being able to develop uh, our relationship with voters, that we're building coalitions, and that we're expanding the electorate for Democrats, and uh, for providing a path to victory for statewide Democrats and for the would-be nominee um, is, is through our digital uh, organizing program. Um, and so we have a set of digital uh, um, organizing trainings that we're providing for free. Uh, uh, they're like digital uh, 101 uh, uh, programs, and then we have a digital 200 level uh, for, for those activists who want to better understand how um, they can leverage the time they would have spent door knocking to try to connect with voters on it, uh, through, through the digital means. And so I'm, I'm happy to share out some of those uh, um, organizing, uh, digital organizing trainings that, that folks can sign up for. Uh, and then but separate from that, we also have train the trainer program that we're administering through both for state parties, um, as well as uh, activists uh, across the country. And, and, and those are, uh, those are uh, uh, sort of very extensive uh, courses. They're about six weeks in length um, that folks can take and that teaches you about grassroots 
uh, organizing um, uh, rest organizing overall, um, both on a digital front and also in person. And we're hoping that uh, <coughs> that after this pandemic, when there's a, maybe um, when things become um, less dangerous uh, and we're able to social distancing does not become uh, an imperative uh, uh, and we can resume our traditional voter contact um, that that uh, folks should still be aware uh, of how we train on how to, to do that. And so we also have an extensive six weeks, uh, six week training training program there. I think um, I think for us, what is critical in the role that, that we have played is we want to empower activists. We want to empower uh, voters. Um, if you um, are committed to uh, getting involved, we want to make sure you're trained and make sure that we put the uh, put the opportunity for you for engagement right in front of you. The 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 other just the one plug that I want to make is we're currently um, a few weeks away from a very critical election. There is a Supreme Court election taking place in Wisconsin. Um, in Wisconsin, in particular, um, it's a uh, it's a nonpartisan it's a nonpartisan election, but but, but just like anything else uh, in our current times. Um, there, there is a, a, a progressive uh, candidate, and and, and there's not. Um, and so I think this is a good op uh, this is a good opportunity for those that are looking to get involved for them to uh, participate and make make phone calls, make virtual phone calls, um, and, and and try to engage voters um, ahead of the election on, on April seventh. And I can uh, share out a couple of opportunities for folks to get in involved there as well. Um, and you know there are there is yes there is a primary presidential primary um, yes there is uh, races. The Congress is up for election. Yes, there are Senate races, uh, but these key Supreme Court races um, uh, and other local races are um, uh, very valuable to ensuring that there's protection of our civil liberties post uh, November as well. And if there's one uh, argument of why this election is the most important coming up in November, it is about the kind of justices we'll have in the Supreme Court as well, yeah. and who's going to be confirmed, and 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 what we'll have to live with for the next. Uh, generation, maybe 30 or, or more right. years. So uh, thank you, uh, Mansoor, for uh, giving us the, this analysis. It's been very eye-opening, eye -opening, very helpful. Um, I want to say, uh, just tell you a little bit about uh, our relationship with your boss, Tom Perez. Um, he used to be the Assistant Attorney General uh, for Civil Rights. Tom Perez is now the head of the Democratic National Committee. But when he was the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights uh, at DOJ, he went to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And Murfreesboro is known for the place where they were trying to de de deny the Muslim community from building a mosque because they were arguing that Islam is not a religion. And that is the number one uh, trope that we are dealing with right now, that we are not a religion, we're a cult. Tom went to Murfreesboro and argued to the courts there that Islam is indeed a religion and Muslims uh, must be protected by the First Amendment. And, and, and that to me will remain as one of the most significant events in our history uh, to be a part of uh, our pluralism of our society of America. So I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, as a personal story of, of you know, with, with Tom and extend him uh, our warmest uh, greetings and hope hopes that uh, he, he, also, he and his family are safe. So Mansur, thank you so much for, for this time. I, I anticipate that we'll prob probably be calling upon you uh, a number of times in the future as we get closer and closer to uh, the Democratic National Convention in July and the, uh, the November elections coming up in uh, the first Tuesday of November. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for, for putting together these um, trainings, uh, these webinars. This is a fantastic series. I really appreciate it. Happy to help um, uh, both with uh, providing additional information and, and, and making sure that, that folks here have what they need to, to do the work that they're doing. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for that opportunity. I think we will take you up on the offer of sending people to be trained for GOTV, GOTV digital uh, canvassing um, and and uh, all the good work that you're doing. We'll probably uh, combine our I Am Change, which is our civic engagement program with some of the work that you're doing. So we, we be, we're happy to have this. Thank you. All right, sir. All right. Thank you, everyone.